Jesus said. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. How about that text, huh? Before we start taking a look at it, though, I do want to celebrate a little bit with you. At 11 o'clock today, we're having six baptisms, none of them babies, third grade through seventh graders. And so, thanks be to God, it'll be a fun service to be at. Now, back to what Jesus was saying here. I think a lot of us probably have one of two reactions to this gospel passage and these rather famous commands that it contains. The first reaction is simple and a little sad. We've heard Jesus command so often that they hardly register anymore. He says, turn the other cheek. And we go, love your enemies. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. And out of our distracted indifference, we rarely think about actually trying to follow these words from Jesus. The other response takes Jesus' words more seriously, but also assumes that they're somewhat out of reach. Turn the other cheek. Are you kidding me? And get treated like a doormat? Not doing that. Love your enemies. You can't be serious. I'll get killed. Both commands and a host of other of Jesus' instructions seem for many, if not most, to be foolishness, idealistic sentimentality. It'd be crazy to try that in the real world. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't kidding. He's dead serious about this stuff. In this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is outlining his vision of God's kingdom and issuing a summons to all those who want to be part of what God is up to. And God isn't even sharing this stuff for the very first time through Jesus. Did you listen to those lessons today from Leviticus when it says, Be holy as your God is holy. And then it goes on to spell out what that holiness looks like caring for the poor by not trying to wring every bit of profit you can out of your harvest. You know, that kind of crazy stuff. You heard it in the psalm. You heard it in the passage from Corinthians. It's a theme that runs all through Scripture, which is why we need to take Jesus' message today seriously. Of course, if what Jesus is saying seems a little crazy to us, we're not alone Critics from both the extreme right and left have often characterized Jesus' teaching as ludicrous. Ayn Rand, who's a political philosopher and a Tea Party hero, wrote, If any civilization is to survive, it is the morality of altruism that men have to reject. If you don't know that word, what he's talking about rejecting, altruism is concern for the welfare of others. 
And on the other end of the spectrum, there's Karl Marx, the father of communism, who once wrote, the social principles of Christianity preach cowardice, self-contempt, abasement, submissiveness, and humbleness. Heaven forbid. But before dismissing these critics too quickly, we should perhaps point out that in one sense, they're right. Turning the other cheek and meeting hatred with love is no way to get ahead in this world. Because the rules of this kingdom are well known. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there. Only the strong survive. But I think that's just the point Jesus is getting at. Jesus isn't trying to modify the rules of this world or work within them. He's not one of these prosperity preachers inviting you to figure out how to stockpile the most cash because it's God's blessing that you can possibly have. Or he's not even trying to encourage you to have your best life now. He's not inviting you to find a safe port amid the storms of this world. He's starting a revolution by calling the rules of this world into question. And at the very same time, He's redeeming this world that he loves. The same world that will, in a very short time after this, put him to death. Jesus calls the powers of the day into question by describing a very different way to relate to each other, inviting us into relationships governed not by power, but by vulnerability a vulnerability grounded in love. As Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. Here, Jesus invites us to overcome the urge for vengeance and retribution with humility and grace, going the other way from what our instinct shares. Yet he isn't satisfied with simply overturning this world because the very heart of Jesus' critique, where he says that we were created not merely for justice, but also for love and for life, that critique is at the same time the only hope for those of us caught up in the orders of this world. Strength eventually fails. Power will corrupt, and the survival of the fittest leaves bodies littering the ground. Love alone transforms. Love alone redeems. Love alone, Jesus says, creates new life, and he yearns for us to trust him and to try life from a different perspective. As Martin Luther King once said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So if we're inclined to read over these familiar words too quickly in our haste to get on with the rest of the story, or if we want to dismiss these commands out of hand as pious idealism, I'd urge us instead to slow down and take them more seriously, or at least think about them. Because in these crazy sentiments, Jesus lays before us the plan for the kingdom he proclaims and this revolution he starts. And before joining, we probably ought to know what we're getting ourselves in for. As we do, however, please allow one more observation. The last line in this passage, it says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think that line helps us to kind of reframe the whole passage. For while telos, the Greek word that Jesus uses, it can be translated as perfect, it typically means something not so much morally perfect, as it means something that has grown up 
matured, become whole, complete. That is, telos is the goal or the desired outcome of a thing fulfilling its purpose. So a fruit tree's telos, we might say, is to grow mature and tall, to be complete so that it can bear fruit. So perhaps Jesus isn't simply commanding something of us, but maybe he's also commending something in us. More possibility than we imagine. Maybe Jesus simply knows we do have more in us. Maybe he knows that we can be and do more than what we've settled for and that we really can make a difference in the world if we simply believe what he has made us to be. I'm hearing in these crazy commands the life-giving invitation to be those people God has created us to be (laughs) so that we might not just endure this challenging life but actually flourish in it, making a difference to those around us by sharing the abundant life Jesus has given us. Sound a little crazy? Maybe. Does to me too. (laughs) But Jesus is not only dead serious about what he promises, he actually will die and rise again to show us that it's true. We, the baptized people of God, we are not perfect and we will always battle with our shadow side. At the same time, I believe Jesus is telling us, you are God's hands here on earth. He's telling us that God has blessed us with the God-given potential to change the world, to live by Jesus Radical kind of ethics right here and now, not in the sweet by and by. To model a new and different way of being in this world that he simply calls the kingdom of God. So before we come to the table today, to this source of life in Holy Communion, I have a little exercise for us. Hopefully, as you were coming in, everyone received a little scrap of paper. If you didn't, grab one of those note pieces out of the pew. On that paper, it says, Believing I am God's beloved child, I know that I'm called to share God's love with others, but I find it hard because... So I want you to spend a minute thinking pondering. And then write down on that slip of paper one thing, one fear, one memory, one hurt, one resentment, one thing that keeps you from embracing and becoming the person God is calling you to be. Then fold that slip up and bring it along with you to the communion rail. As you come up, you're going to find there's four little white trash baskets, one at the front of each section. Drop that idea in the basket and let it go. The idea is to present to God our honest confession and trusting that God loves us. Leave it behind. Nobody's going to read these, but God will see them. And in so doing, we may feel a little less burden, having confessed our limitations and been enfolded again in God's love. And who knows? Perhaps in this little way, we'll actually leave finding it a bit easier to love, forgive, help others. So come, unburden yourself and receive the gift of life. And to God be the glory. Amen.